So now we're going to go through in the next series of lectures each of the specific epigenetic modifications that are called epigenetic marks and they have functional consequences for how the genes are expressed and how the chromatin is packaged. So while we'll go through each of these, this is the relevance of these and how they um, specifically relate to the epigenetic phenomena or the particular examples we're going to go through in the later lectures, um, we, will, we will deal with that in later lectures and just have brief highlights of that here. But we need to go through and learn about how each of these work in order to really be able to understand at the molecular level how these uh, processes are working in other instances. So we're going to start with DNA methylation. So DNA methylation is, as it sounds, the addition of a methyl group to the DNA. And this happens at cytosines. So here we're showing um, a cytosine single ring base. But we can add on the five methyl groups. So it's added onto the five carbon, the fifth carbon here. And the methyl group is a CH3 group that's added directly onto that base. We know that in mammals, DNA methylation occurs almost exclusively at Cs that are followed by Gs, so cytosines followed by guanines, and this is called a CPG dinucleotide, and the P is just for the phosphate bond between the two. There's good reason that it's found almost exclusively at CPG dinucleotides, and that's because these um, dinucleotides are symmetrical when you look at the other side, the other strand of DNA, and this allows them to be maintained through cell division. And you remember this is one of those hallmark features of epigenetic modifications. So how is it then that DNA methylation can be laid down and how can it be um, copied uh, mitotically? So how is it that it can, can have this mitotic memory? So here pictured is a, is a very simple um, picture of a DNA strand shown by the black um, lines and then in the middle this CPG dinucleotide. And in each case this, the cytosine is methylated. So this methylation, because it's close by to one another, the cytosine on the other strand um, is very close by and so it's methylated as well. What happens when the cell divides? Um, so, oh, Sorry, I'll go back a step and say that the first thing that happens is that DNA methyltransferases, um, so these are enzymes and in, in mammals they're known as DNMT3A and DNMT3B, um, these lay down the methylation and they do this in a de novo fashion. In other words, they work on um, DNA that's begins out being unmethylated. So they lay down these, these methyl marks during development. Then how is it that it can be maintained? Well, if we go through cell division, we have the parent strand, in each case shown here in black, and the daughter strand shown in green. So when the DNA is replicated, there's only going to be the parent strand that maintains the methyl group on that cytosine within the CPG dinucleotide. And then the daughter strand now, shown in green, we have an unmethylated um, cytosine in each case. Now what happens is we bring in DNMT1, so another DNA methyltransferase enzyme. And this DNA methyltransferase specifically recognize, recognizes hemimethylated DNA. It has a preference for hemimethylated DNA, that is where one, um, one strand is methylated and the other is not. And it's this hemimethylated DNA is then bound by DNMT1, and DNMT1 then lays down methylation on the daughter strand. And we have um, the, uh, the rest restoration of a fully methylated CPG dinucleotide. And this is how we know that DNA methylation can be a stable epigenetic mark, because at every cell division, this DNA methylation will be copied by DNMT1 onto the new daughter strands of DNA. So we know... Um, I said that, CPG, that CPGs are where you, you mostly find methylation or almost exclusively find methylation in mammals. So where are these CPGs found? Well, many CPGs are found in what are termed CPG islands. So this is where you find more CG dinucleotides than you would expect by chance. And they tend to be found at the promoters of genes. So these, a promoter, just to remind you, is the region upstream of the start site of transcription of a gene, and it's where the transcription factors bind. The general rule to remember is that CPG islands, although they have many CPGs there, in fact tend to be protected from methylation. So methylation doesn't tend to occur at CPG islands. It tends to be that it's, it occurs at other places in the genome. But if you do find methylation of a CPG island, then this is almost universally synonymous with silencing of gene expression. So DNA methylation is an inactive um, meth uh, epigenetic mark. So there are some CPG islands in the genome 
that are, that are found to be methylated. So while the general rule is that they are unmethylated, there are some that are associated with gene silencing, and these are found at particular times and with dynamic methylation between different cell types. However, it's mostly been studied, DNA methylation at CPG islands, for the inactive X chromosome that I have mentioned a few times. So I'd like to go into a little bit more detail here about X inactivation. So the reason for that is that X inactivation really clearly demonstrates the mitotic heritability of DNA methylation. So we know that females have two X chromosomes, whereas males have one X and one Y. So if we just consider the nucleus of these female and male cells, then the female cell would have twice the dose of all of the genes that reside on the X chromosome, of which there are over a thousand genes. This in fact is not what ends up happening. What happens is that one of those two X chromosomes, either the one you inherited from your mum or the one you inherited from your dad, is chosen and it's densely packed down in the cell as shown here. And this is called the inactive X chromosome. So while females have two X chromosomes, they only ever use one. The second goes by unused and is put in, indeed even put to the side in the nucleus, literally put to the side. So What's interesting is this, when this X inactivation first occurs, it occurs when there are only a few hundred cells in the embryo at gastrulation. And we know that when this choice is made, it's a random choice. So each cell at that couple of hundred cell stage can make the choice individually as to which X chromosome to inactivate, the one from your mum or the one from your dad. That choice is then mitotically heritable to all of the daughter cells. So this X inactivation involves DNA methylation of the CPG islands, all a thousand of them or so, or almost all a thousand of them on the inactive X chromosome. And it's this, this mitotic heritability after the choice is made is partly ensured by the DNA methylation of those CPG islands. So this is actually able to be observed um, in a visible way in the coat color of cats. So I'm gonna show you a small movie here which is about calico cats. What we can see is that Calico cats that are shown in this picture here have genes that encode the coat color genes that are on the X chromosome. So they can either have the ginger version or the black version. And then the choice is made early in development um, to have the ginger one being active or the black one being active. And the other one is silenced. The other chromosome is silenced. And so you end up with these cats that have a mottled appearance based on when that choice of which X should be inactivated was made early in development. So this could, is also the case not only in cats, of course, but it's also true in humans. So in humans, if we had a coat color marker like this, which of course we don't, but if we had a coat color marker like this, you would actually see these patches of green skin and patches of pink skin based on when that choice was made early in development. Just as in female humans, just as you see in female cats, they have this calico appearance if they happen to have the right genetics. It's also interesting to note then that you actually can't get male calico cats Male calico cats, if they exist, have had a mutation where they actually have two copies of an X chromosome but still have a Y chromosome. Otherwise, they could not have this calico appearance, this traditional mottled appearance. So how is it then that DNA methylation, which we've just discussed, is heritable um, for many, many, many cell divisions? And if you think about it, in human mammals can be, can, um, can be heritable for maybe 100 years. How is it that the DNA methylation actually is associated with gene silencing? There are probably at least a couple of mechanisms by which this can happen. So perhaps the primary mechanism is because these CPG, these methylated CPGs are associated with um, a con condensation of the uh, chromatin. And the way that this happens in the primary case is because the methylated CPG is bound by methylated CPG binding proteins, which are otherwise known as MECP1 and MECP2. So these MECP1 and MECP2 proteins bind to the methylated CPG dinucleotide, and they themselves can um, alter um, transcription by, because, because they have, possess a transcriptional repression domain. Alternatively, the MECP2 or MECP1 protein can itself bring in its own protein partners, and they can condense the chromatin. But for this primary mechanism, it seems to be the binding of the methylated CPG by the methylation, methylated binding protein domain family. Probably the secondary mechanism, which doesn't seem to be as important but can still occasionally occur, um, is that the methylated CPG will stop a transcription factor binding. So transcription factors have particular binding sites, say for example um, CGAT. 
So this binding site might be bound by a protein, a transcription factor, and it will then enable the um, transcription of the neighbouring gene or the nearby gene. However, if this uh, particular site now has the same sequence, CGAT, but it's a methylated CGAT, this will then block the binding of that transcription factor. So just that small addition of the, the methyl group will not allow the transcription factor to bind, and therefore we don't have transcription ensuing. So we don't think, although there are some specific examples of this occurring, for example, for the transcription factor SP1, we don't think it's a generalizable mechanism. And instead, it seems to be just true for promoters that don't have so many CPGs. And so therefore, even single CPGs will have a large consequence. Rather, we think that primary mechanism where the methylated CPG binding proteins bind to the methylated CPG is likely to be the most um, dominant mechanism within the nucleus.